Welcome back, Canaanites, and just, whoa, I honestly don't have words. Sunday was fucking epic, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's take a step back and start at the beginning. Sunday saw the release of episode one of Hunt the Truth, and what a hell of a start. Much better than anything I was expecting, though to be honest, I wasn't entirely sure what to expect. In a good way. But as we know, there was also meant to be a live-action trailer, and goddamn was there one, uh, two. <laughs> But again, getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about Hunt the Truth, then get into the trailers. Episode 1 starts off by correcting the pronunciation of Giraud's name, even though every source I can find says it's pronounced Jihu. But anyway, the episode actually starts off with Ben describing his experience in New Mombasa on the morning of October 20th, 2552, the day the Covenant arrived at Earth. Ben's description of the events is kind of strange, as he talks about how the Master Chief seemed to appear out of nowhere, repelled a global invasion, and then disappeared. It's strange for a number of reasons, really. For one thing, the Covenant invasion didn't end when John left. Reinforcements were in the city almost immediately after Regret left. And of course, UNSC forces, including other Spartans, continued to defend Earth in the following weeks when John was absent. Of course, Ben could be summarizing the events between October 20th and November 17th with a bit of the official story mixed in. Stranger still is that Ben says the UNSC released a statement about the Master Chief, who he was, where he's from, obviously with all the dirty bits edited out, and that he was continuing to protect humanity. But why would such a statement need to be released? The way Ben words things, it would seem to indicate that the Chief wasn't that well known, but as we learn in Halo Escalation, Petra Janicek made her career covering the Master Chief's exploits, and the guy was well known enough that Gabriel Thorne had an action figure of him. It could be, though, that Ben is just fluffing things up and whatnot. Ben moves forward, giving us a brief summary of the Master Chief's official background, which brings up yet another oddity, Eridanus II. When Ben brings it up, he says not to bother visiting, noting that it was catastrophically glassed in 2530, which we know. The strange part, though, is that by 2558, if not earlier, flights to Elysium City, the capital of Eridanus II, were being offered from Nova Austin Station. Now, granted, this is a war game simulation, so mentions of Elysium City could be nothing more than an Easter egg, but I'm slightly more inclined to think that Eridanus II might have actually been reclaimed by the UEG. The flight board in question offering trips to New Albany, which we know for a fact by 2555, was a viable destination. Plus, from the perspective of a Earthborn socialite, Ben's words, Elysium City, and by extent all of Eridanus too, might not really be a worthwhile visit, whatever state it's in. So, on to the meat of the story. We start with a couple of interviews with people from Eridanus too, people that knew John. The first is one of John's school teachers, a man by the name of Dion Govender. Govinder starts out by, more or less, giving us old information about John. That he was smart, took things in, and was really damn good at King of the Hill. Old news to be sure, but the actor just gives us a much more personal perspective on the matter, and he really sells it. The interview then jumps over to one of John's childhood friends, Ellie Bloom. Ellie gives us some new details about John's childhood. Mainly that she, John, and another friend named Katrina would go over to a nearby vacant lot and make obstacle courses and just have fun. Then things get interesting. She goes on to talk about how they'd sometimes hang out late at night in grassy fields staring at the stars. So basically, Ellie is the girl seen with John in the Halo 3 trailer Starry Night. Like I said last week, 343 at its finest. People have been wondering for years who that girl was, and now we know. Moving forward, we learn a bit about how Ben tracked down these interviewees. Many were lined up by Oni, which we know from the letter from Sullivan, but a few, such as Ellie, were tracked down by connections Ben had in the Outer Colonies. This is important, and I'll explain why later. The interview with Ellie continues, Ellie noting that she hadn't much kept up with John, her access to Waypoint, the future version of the internet, among many things, being limited as a child. The interview with Ellie closes with Ben revealing that John is the Master Chief, and Ellie having a very fangirl-like freakout. Keep this all in mind as we move forward, I promise. It's important. We then shift back to Dion, who talks a bit about John joining a high school boxing group at age 12. As would be expected, John kicked serious ass. What's really funny about this section is how it somewhat mirrors John's first fight following his augmentations in 2525. In Dion's story, John is able to take on two teens that would have wrecked anyone else John's age. In reality, following his augmentations, John took on five ODSTs without a sweat, accidentally killing two of them and leaving the others severely injured. I have to wonder if the parallel is deliberate. Stories based on the smallest of truths are much better than stories based on nothing. The story then takes a darker turn, talking about how the insurrection came to Epsilon Eridani. 
we shift over to an interview with a man by the name of Thomas Wu from a colony that neighbored Eridanus II. Tom describes the terror the colonists felt as the insurrectionists enacted an inquisition-like policy, abductions, interrogations, the whole nine yards. The rebels got more and more paranoid as time went on, and then they were just gone. I can't help but wonder if this might be a reference to some of the earliest missions the Spartans took on. John's first mission, in fact, was to capture the traitor, Colonel Robert Watts, leader of the Eridanus rebels. The insurrectionist activity Thomas Wu described, though, started in 2524, a year before John's mission, and the time frame between when they came and when they left is extremely unclear. Now, I said this section gets dark, and I meant that. Tom talks about how he and other detainees were left in locked cells when the rebels cleared out. Though many survived, not all were so lucky. When they did get out, they got out of the system. Tom lists several locations the people relocated to, including New Jerusalem, New Alexandria, and Perth City. There were others, but I couldn't make them out. New Jerusalem is a city on the planet of New Jerusalem, home to Jelan Al-Signi, an Oni agent from Halo Contact Harvest, and once lover of Sergeant Avery Johnson. It was also the site of a major battle in 2552, which the rookie from Halo 3 ODST took part in. New Alexandria we all know from Halo Reach, and Perth City was the capital of Arcadia seen in Halo Wars. When asked about Elysium City as a possible relocation point, Tom dismisses it, noting it as a cesspool of insurrectionist activity. Insert Star Wars joke here. Now, this also strikes me as a little weird. Tom really paints a picture of the insurrectionists as straight-up bad guys, which we as fans know isn't necessarily the case. Hell, Colonel Watts was shown to be something of an honorable man in the comic adaptation of Fall of Reach, I can't help but wonder if Tom may be exaggerating the truth, or if Oni went out of their way to find someone who had the worst of it, though maybe not the normal experience. Anyway, we wrap up with Tom and shift back to Dion, who talks in detail about what Elysium was like under rebel control. He describes people and entire neighborhoods disappearing, scary stuff to be sure. Dion then wraps up his statement with a rousing bit that notes how amazing it is that John was able to rise up from such turmoil and do what he did. Almost the perfect hero's beginning, ain't it? Ben sure thinks so. The episode comes to a close with Ben looking through some documents that had survived the attack on Eridanus II, gathered by another of Ben's contacts. In it, he found a document that confirms what we as fans already know. Officially, John died in 2517 at the age of six. That concludes the first proper episode of Hunt the Truth, and fuck is it something. Full of wonderful easter eggs, but really giving us quite the mystery. I can't even imagine what it must be like for fans unfamiliar with the expanded universe, because I'm having quite the trip myself. A conspiracy is afoot, but who is part of it? Dion Govender has to be a fake. Remember, he's one of the interviews that Oni set up. The fact that he has memories of John at the age of 12 would seem to confirm his bullshittery. But then, consider how sincere he sounds. Could Oni be forcing him to say what he said? Or have altered his memories somehow? Dion has to be old by 2558. So could Oni have convinced Dion that John didn't die at the age of six, and given him the idea that he encountered John for years after the Flash clone died? It's quite the convoluted setup, but with Oni, who knows? Another possibility that comes to mind is that Dion is being honest, but is remembering a different John, also from Elysium City, who happened to be similar enough to the Chief. I mean, Dion's interview was set up by Oni, and in the interview itself, they never used John's last name, as far as we know. Plus, John is an extremely common name, so the possibility of finding another John in Elysium City, who is similar enough to John 117, may not be that much of a stretch. Someone like Ellie, on the other hand, seems like she could be the real deal. She only really talks about hanging out with a really young John, age unspecified, and then falling out of contact. It's possible she never heard of her friend's death or, in the wake of the Human Covenant War, forgot. Thomas Wu is another mystery altogether. He has no direct connection to John, so his story may be sincere. However, the way he talks about how the rebels treated the colonists, it's very in line with how the UNSC likes to portray insurrectionists, so it's just a little fishy. However, the big takeaway is this. Oni was originally trying to sell the hero's story to make a positive profile on the Master Chief, and in such a way that it tells of his rise from humble beginnings to savior of the galaxy. I do find it strange, though, that Oni would let Ben publish what he's discovering, considering Oni's hand in the true origins of the Spartan II program. As I speculated in the most recent canon fodder, might Michael Sullivan, a man who, at one time, was trying to hack Oni classified files to discover the truth, be trying to get the truth out? Are we hunting for the truth in more ways than we thought? 
Given Ben's search for people other than those lined up by Oni and the fact that he now knows of John's death at the age of six, I have to wonder if Parissa, one of John's closest childhood friends, may be involved in an episode or several as we go forward. Parissa knew John, the two had promised to marry, and she saw him die. I can only imagine what she might say about John being the Master Chief, especially since the two actually ran into each other during the Battle of New Mombasa. Along with the episode of Hunt the Truth, Sunday also brought us two live-action trailers. Both are brief, but both are fucking awesome. The first released was the Spartan Locke trailer. We find Locke in a destroyed city, Locke giving a speech about how the Chief, yes, the Chief, is responsible for the destruction. Eventually, we come across the Chief beneath a statue of himself, beaten and battered, a huge hole in his chest plate. Locke throws down his DMR, readies his pistol, and cut to the Halo 5 logo. So, is the Chief a traitor? Does Spartan Locke truly have to save us from him? As we were told throughout last week, there are two sides to every story. The Master Chief trailer came out not long after, painting a very different picture of events. This time, the Chief is making his way to the statue where Locke lies beaten, the Chief asking if it was all worth it. He pulls out his pistol, saying that Locke has completed his mission while the Chief's is only just beginning, and as before, cut to Halo 5 logo. So what is the truth? Who is the hero and who is villain? Let's break down these two trailers. Now in both, we see the destroyed city. Now this is a place we've actually seen before, in the very first piece of Halo 5 concept art ever released. How do we know it's the same city? This structure, right here. And just like in the concept piece, we can see infinity in the sky. Of course, in both trailers, Infinity is in pretty shitty condition. You can clearly make out at least three shots hit the ship. However, Infinity is still flying. What I personally find really interesting about the damage to Infinity is that it heavily resembles the damage done by plasma or hard light weaponry. In fact, so does the hole on the Chief's chest plate. Could this destruction have something to do with Jules Covenant and or the Didax Prometheans? The official description for Halo 5 mentions colonies coming under attack from an alien threat. That would seem to line up with what we're seeing in both trailers. Next up, let's talk about HUDs. Locke's HUD is very similar to what we saw in the Halo 5 beta, with a shield and health bar, but also a compass. The compass is most likely just a visual feature like in Halo Reach, but it would be interesting if Halo 5 took advantage of that like in Halo 3 ODST. Now contrast that to the Chief's HUD. Chief's is pretty much what we saw in Halo 4 and looks slightly less advanced. It's a nice reflection of John being the old guard and Locke being the new soldier. Now for the major stuff, mainly when these two trailers take place. As we look at several details, it would seem to be clear that Locke's trailer is set before the Chief's. The damage to Infinity and Chief's trailer looks like it's gotten worse, perhaps indicative of another fight between the two trailers. Infinity is also further away. The sun is setting in Chief's trailer, whereas it's a bright midday in Locke's, and the statue in the Chief's trailer is much more damaged. Of course, this doesn't really explain why the Chief's armor is suddenly A-OK. -okay. The big thing in both trailers, though, is the statue of the Chief. In Locke's trailer, it's pristine, reflective of his statement. Let us remember him as our protector, and not the one who gave us this. Let us see him forever as you, and not as you. The statue represents the idea of the chief, the idea of the stoic hero, while the truth, as Locke sees it, is that the chief has fallen, betrayed humanity in some unknown manner. Meanwhile, in the Chief's trailer, the statue looks much more damaged. There's rebar showing and huge chunks missing, notably on the helmet. This is representative of the Chief's broken nature, perhaps how he sees himself. It's simple but beautiful symbolism about the dual nature of any event or person, how perspective can mean anything when interpreting a series of events or the decisions of one man. The last thing I want to talk about is the Chief's speech. Locke's speech is pretty straightforward, but that doesn't seem to be the case for the Chief. Throughout his trailer, the Chief is speaking about whether it was all worth it, but he never looks at Locke until the very end. The rest of the time, he's looking at the destroyed statue. Could the Chief be talking to himself, monologuing, reflecting on whether what he did to cause this destruction was worth it? It would seem to be the case. There's so much going on in these two trailers, and it gives me goosebumps just thinking about what may happen in Halo 5. Up front, it would seem that the Chief has gone rogue, and whatever he's doing is putting the UNSC and the Earth's colonies at risk. But as we know, there's always more to it, two sides to every story. Halo 5 is said to be the darkest Halo to date, and I'm starting to believe it. I cannot wait. Speaking of waiting, we finally have a launch date, October 27th. 
I have speculated that Halo Escalation's absolute record story arc will be four issues long, and if that's the case, it would conclude just a month before Halo 5 launches. Assuming I'm correct, of course. So, thank you for joining me, as always. Please let me know if I missed anything in regards to the trailer or the Haunt the Truth episode. And yes, I know that Locks HUD shows a BR while he's holding a DMR. It's a technical oversight. Anyway, for now, this has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you all next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. It means more than I can express in a few minutes of audio. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, share it around on whatever social media you see fit, and all that jazz. Thank you so much. Your support is everything. I would not be where I am without you. Thanks.